And it's a beautiful day to be a Princeton Reverb reissue, isn't it? Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Forgotten Gear Restorations. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you're hearing any smacky lips throughout this recording, it's just me eating snacks. Bye. Top of the morning, goons and mutants. Happy Monday. The project is upon us. This is a 65 Princeton Reverb reissue. And this is an amp uh, that many people consider to be one of Fender's best reissues, and I'm one of them. Um, but has been covered prior and has again been beaten to death. I mean, it's just been wrung out. Uh, the, this series of amps has some pretty glaring shortcomings with respect to less tone and more reliability. But there are things we can do to circumvent and even improve upon these things and give them a fighting chance to be on par with their vintage brethren or even uh, beyond with respect to whether we're tonally and uh, from a reliability standpoint. It doesn't take a lot, but given the construction of this amp, uh, it's pretty labor intensive. So I'll just highlight uh, a few of the things uh, that I want to do. Um, well, I'll just lightly go over the battle plan for this little guy. So let me get this thing chucked up into a mount. So while it is my aim to make and produce a longer video for you guys, um, bear in mind that this is a production shop. I'm going to have to... Uh, I have to provide for the family, so I can't get into all the details. This will not be a how-to or step-by-step -step anything here. I'm just going to uh, create something that will serve as a bit of a documentary for the owner, and that's what I do for you guys. Uh, and then also, just to sort of share my thoughts and opinions on what should be done with these. Now, um, if you're an engineer or if you're a savvy technician then you know that there are things that we rely on called best practices and, and, and benchmarking. So w when you're setting about on this journey, you're going to do those two things if you're savvy. And you want to create a game plan or a workflow. Maybe you want to break things down uh, circuit by circuit or area by area so that you can more thoughtfully and accurately address uh, some of the issues with these guys and, and just better for goalkeeping as well. So there's nothing new under the sun. And if, if you want to go and, and do your own benchmarking, you will uh, undoubtedly and you will certainly run into some of Lyle Caldwell's work over at Cyanic Audio. Um, Lyle's a guy who's incredibly thoughtful and smart with his approach to doing repairs and uh, modifications. And, and, and he's a guy that you want to follow. Obviously you are. If you're watching this and you already know who that guy is. But I want to say that a lot of what I'm doing has already been done by that guy. Um, some of it hasn't. And it's just... I'm adding in some of my own uh, personal experience uh, with working on the reissues and then just some of my own philosophies uh, as I approach these things. So having said all that, let's take a peek. And I like to start at, at the power amplifier. Um, obviously, all of these uh, nasty old Illinois caps, these are not the incredibly cheap ones. Those, are the, those would be the gray guys, but these aren't much better. These got to go. What does most of the damage uh, to these reissue boards, and I mean, even if you're looking across uh, Fender's other lines, uh, the, the Hot Rod family, it, it all pertains to thermal damage on these circuit boards. So while this is a relatively cheaply constructed uh, circuit board, it doesn't have to fail. But it's certainly going to if you leave things as is. So 
The first thing I want to do is take all of the high current and high voltage stuff off of this board as much as possible. And, and you could just look back in time to the 60s and 50s. There's ample space on these uh, relatively nice quality uh, tube sockets here. I'm not a big fan of ceramic, but uh, the eyelets on these terminals are very nice uh, and large, so they can accommodate the leads. We're gonna wire this up old school style. This is a steel chassis. We're gonna reinstate the chassis ground uh, practice, uh, moving the, the high tension center tap there, uh, also running the resistors from the, the heater reference there as well. I've seen those go up in flames with certain types of failures that, that require some reconstructive work on the circuit board. So uh, as, as much as we can take off of this, this end of the circuit board, we'll, we'll do that. Um, we're going to clean up this rat's nest. That's another thing. All these uh, all these really constrictive cable ties are going away, as, as well as the majority of, of, of these looms here. They need to go. I don't like this power switch. It's fine that it's switching It's it's switching the neutral and hot uh, simultaneously. That's fine. Uh, but I've seen these guys arc internally. I've, I've seen them fall apart physically. So in order to avoid that vector of failure... I'm going to be putting in an old school style Carling power switch. We're going to switch the neutral and fuse the hot. Uh, jury's out on this particular uh, fuse holder body. I don't know if we're going to maintain that. We'll see. Um, all these spade lugs, uh, they're going to go bye bye in, in as much as possible. So we're going to leave ourselves uh, as much space as possible to do what we have to do. Um, obviously, when you're looking at the screen grid resistors, those are going away. The, the droppers on the board can stay. However, uh, we've all seen those go up in flames. Uh, we're going to put a higher quality uh, part in, in place of each, and we're going to give them some sufficient air gap just to safeguard the board. Um, uh, these diodes running off the plates of, of the octals there, they're going away. Um, while that's a nifty practice, um, in, in theory, in, in reality, uh, it, it's only going to serve to protect the tube itself. It's not going to protect the output transformer. So in this place, we're going to use MOVs. They're going to serve to to clamp down and dissipate that extra energy um, that would be in the form of a, a spike that would normally pierce the laminations of your output transformer. Once it exceeds whatever rating on the MOV uh, we've determined we need, um, it'll clamp down, conduct, and then dissipate that energy until it's a, it's a safe environment. Um, we, we really want to try to run things straight from the transformers to the appropriate pin on the appropriate socket. All right, so that's the basic approach to what we're going to do with the power amp. And then uh, looking at, at the preamp end of things, it's just going to be a lot of cleanup. It's going to be a lot of cleanup. Um, we'll unhobble you know, some of the circuits here. Lyle's gone over that um, uh, ad nauseum. Um, so nothing new under the sun. But I'm going to go ahead and uh, strip down this chassis as much as possible and see if we can start. Bye. Now, um, these use an Allen key, these knobs, uh, the set screw, and... Um, we're going to assume that they're Asian in origin, and we're going to grab a millimeter set. And I'm just guessing sometimes you get, sometimes, hey, I got lucky. Sometimes you get lucky. Two down, two down, two down, three dollar. And down, forty, 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 the front panel, but also tighten up that hardware, nasty hardware. So, get that stuff Let's off. tackle these input jacks. What's your standard size? So, Fender places oh, all the all the resistors that would go along on the jack onto a smaller circuit board. 
and that just creates another opportunity for things to go awry. Additionally, uh, sometimes, pardon me, sometimes uh, when these are tightened appropriately, more strain is actually transferred to the, the circuit board and the solder joints. So it, it's oftentimes a best practice to once these are torqued properly to go through and just remelt the joints. And then sometimes you'll physically see the components uh, resettling. And that's how you know you've taken stress off the thing. Pretty cool stuff. And they make it pretty easy for the tech to go through and remove the circuit board here. And we appreciate that. Get all these nasties out the way. So probably just patch in the after clip here. Wants to see our watch a guy clip off these cable ties. What kind of time do you guys have in your hands? Don't be creepy. So I'll be right back. All right, here we go. I'm starting with the caps, and then you'll see some some markings there done with a fine temp. Uh, was it a marks a lot here in this case, or a sharpie? And all that's going to go away once I have all the components uh, installed or adjusted. Get that old flux off too. Make them nice and shiny. Nice clean board. And this is just a, a simple rubber band that is uh, using a quarter inch plug as an anchor. It takes the stress off of things. I don't have to hold this up with my left hand pinky as I'm working along the bottom. All right, I've gotten most of the power amp cleaned up. However, I do have a lot more work to do. And then even after I'm done wiring and installing everything, you can see you know, the new droppers there. Everybody's happy. See that going in there? Everyone's happy. So I just have to line some things up just to satisfy some of my uh, neuroses, and then we'll take it from there. It's about all I can do. So obviously I have uh, the ground situation to work on. I have a grid stopper, screen grid resistors, and all that good stuff for the octals to take care of still the MOVs in lieu of these uh, diodes uh, sitting on a plate going to ground, on the plates rather. whole lot of cleanup but already it's looking a lot nicer so pretty happy with that talk to you soon